I think the energy provides a special perspective to understand the planetary atmospheres. So, right here is the big picture of the planetary atmospheres from the energy perspective. Uh, there are three processes I think is pretty important. The first process, the, the first process is on the top of the atmosphere, where I think the radiant energy budget is pretty important. Uh, the second one is the radiative transfer. Radiative, radiative transfer can generate potential energy. Potential energy can convert it into kinetic energy and drive atmosphere for circulation or something else. Uh, so that's the third process. Okay, uh, in this presentation, I will talk two processes. The first process is that's the radiant energy budget. Also, the third one, the me mechanical energy cycle. Uh, the second second process, radi radiative transfer and other energy formats, will not be discussed today. Okay, uh, right here is the big picture for the radiant energy budget for planet or satellite. You can right here you can find for whatever planet or satellite, it gets energy from the sun, and at the same time, it radiates energy to space. So you have the, some balance on the top of the atmosphere. So, but anyway, for the terrestrial planets or satellites, only two energy sources, one is from the sun, the other is the outgoing energy. So basically, two energy sources determine the energy budget. But for the giant planets, that's different. There are one more energy source from inside, we call internal heat. So internal heat is pretty important. It's very closely related to the planetary formation and evolution. In other words, internal heat can help us to understand the planetary formation and evolution. For the terrestrial planets and satellites, radiant energy budget can help us to understand the climate change, the polar ice, even the jet plumes on some satellites like the Enceladus and Europa. Okay. Uh, right here, I want to talk about the, some recent progress in understanding the radiant energy budgets of a planet. This slide shows the immediate power of a Jupiter and a Saturn. The left figure shows the immediate power of a Jupiter. Uh, this direction is the immediate power. Or what you call direction is the latitude. The blue curve, blue profile, is observation from a voyage since 1979. The red line is observation from Cassini, that's 2000, 2001. The comparison right here shows a very strong temporal variation from a voyage time to Cassini time, that's for Jupiter. This panel shows the immediate power of Saturn from 2004 to 2013, roughly 10 years. Also, you can see very clear seasonal change in the two hemispheres from 2004 to 2013. Also, if you pay attention right here, median latitudes in North Hemisphere, from 2010, this curve, to 2011, that, there are strong increase of immediate power on Saturn. Why? That's because 2010 giant storm happened in that year. So in other words, we think the giant storms are very important for the radiant energy budget on giant planets. Okay, here, immediate power only the part of the story because the radiant energy budget is determined by two energy sources. One is the uh, outgoing energy, the other is absorbed solar energy. The absorbed solar energy is determined by albedo. Right here, I show right here, is the four disk albedo of Jupiter. The two dimensional demand one is the wavelength go this direction, other is the face angle. So I think that's the first time we got we got this because the Cassini observation are perfect. So we have the chance to get a two-dimensional uh, AOB for Jupiter for the first time. Anyway, so you can find you know, based on the 2D four disk AOB like this, we can calculate the bound AOB of Jupiter, which is 0.5 based on right here. Also, we can calculate the internal heat for Jupiter. We got the value is 7.5 watts per, uh, per meter square. That's the new values I put it right here. But if you compare the old values from uh, the very limited observations, that's from Voyager and Pioneer, you can find a big difference. 
The reason is because I think the previous observations not that good. Pioneer, voyage, you know, the face angle is very limited. Also, the wavelength coverage is not perfect. So I think, in my opinion, I think, actually, we just published this paper on nature communications. Anyway, we think the new values right here are best results for Jupiter. Integer heat is pretty important for the giant planet, for the formation and evolution. So the new results right here make us to double check the models and theories of planetary formation and evolution for the giant planets. Also, because right here we show the results for Jupiter. Jupiter results show, suggest probably the previous measurements of the radiant energy budget and internal heat of a giant planets are not correct. So we have to double check not only Jupiter, but also other three giant planets. That's the point. Okay, that's for Jupiter. Let's move to Saturn. Saturn is much more complicated. Why? Because of the ring effects. The rings can reflect, block, even re-emit radiance. So make the radiant energy budget very complicated. But anyway, we got some progress. Here's, you know, the, we have a ring, very complicated ring model. Based on that, we have, the, you know, calculated the solar flux on Saturn. You know, the time goes this way. Uh, the latitude go the vertical direction. So the top panel show the solar flux and Saturn without the rings. That's pretty easy to calculate. But anyway, the second one is very complicated. So blocking, scattering, emitting, we have a very fancy formula to calculate. But anyway, we basically finish it. Use the ring effects in the second panel. So we put it together, we have the last one for the solar flux and Saturn with ring effects. So that's pretty important. So based on this, also based on the Cassini observations, we can calculate the absorbed solar radiance. Then we can finish the story of a radiant energy budget and internal heat for Saturn. Okay, that's for Saturn. Right here, move to the Titan. Titan is the biggest satellite of Saturn. So based on Cassini observations, we calculate the emitted power of, of a Titan for the first time. This figure show, you know, latitude goes this way, immediate power goes this way, the different colors represent different years. But anyway, so you can first, you can see the signal change from year to year. That's for, because one year for, for Titan actually is 30 years. It's pretty long. Right here is a signal change. But anyway, also we combine the new observation of immediate power right here with the old observation of the absorbed solar radiance. Then we conclude, you know, we think the radiant energy budget of a Titan is basically balanced. Okay, the, also we, this panel shows the global average immediate power of a Titan from year to year. So basically from 2007 to 2013, you can find the global average immediate power decreased with time. So roughly it's decreased 2.5% from 2007 to 2013. Immediate power decreased on Saturn from 2007 to 2013. And at the same time, solar flux decreased more than 10% from 2007 to 2013. This figure shows you know, the distance between Titan and the Sun increased. So the solar flux decreased more than 10%. That means it's still possible. A small energy imbalance happens over there on Titan. Even you know we 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 think the roughly you know the energy budget is roughly balanced, but it's still possible a small energy imbalance. The reason is because recently a small energy imbalance suggested for Earth. Also, people think the small energy imbalance probably. It's very important for climate change, for global warming. Right here, we, we, we suggest it's also possible for, for, for Titan, a small energy imbalance. We still double check because we have to calculate the immediate power, also calculate the absorbed solar radiance. Then we can get the whole story. That's for, that's for Titan. We're still working on that. This is for Enceladus. In recent years, Enceladus is pretty hot because we discovered the jet plumes in the South Pole. Right here, we calculate 
the albedo, faulty albedo, based on continuing observations, right here, just for the red wavelengths. So your first angle goes this way, that's the geometry, uh, uh, albedo. So we basically finished it. Okay, two minutes, right? Okay, we basically finished the calculation of the immediate power for Enceladus. We still working on the outgoing energy. Then you can finish the whole story. Okay, right here is the second topic is the Lorentz, uh, Lorentz energy cycle of Earth and Mars. So basically, the Lorentz energy cycle provides a method to understand the planetary atmosphere from a mechanical energy perspective. So it describes a process in which the solar flux generates potential energy, then the potential energy changes to uh, kinetic energy, then drive the circulation, something like that. But anyway, here is for Earth's results. The previous results based on very limited observations. Right here, we have more than time, we have satellite observations. So we double check the big picture of the energy cycle for Earth. Right here, you have new values. If you compare the new picture with the old picture, you can find some terms in the old picture is not correct. Also, we double check the global average. Global average Lorentz energy cycle for Earth. We find if we take Earth global atmosphere as a heat engine, actually its efficiency increased in the past 35 years. So we published it with this paper with my student. Okay, that's for that's for Earth. Here is uh, for mass. We double check the Lorentz energy cycle of our mass atmosphere. We find basically the Lorentz energy cycle of our mass atmosphere is like that of Earth's atmosphere. But still, you can find some difference. For example, you know the for Earth, the mean potential energy is dominant. But for Earth, uh, but for mass, AD potential energy is dominant. Still, some difference between the two planets. Okay, here's the conclusion. I think we provide some studies, recent studies for the you know, rating the energy budgets, also the Lorentz energy cycle. So we hope we can apply the studies to other planets and satellites in our solar system. It's also possible to apply our studies to exoplanets. Also, we are discussing an instrument or maybe a possible mission to observe some planets and uh, some planets and satellites in our solar system. The reason is because the current observations of some planets and satellites are not good, not good for the studies of radiant the energy budgets. So we think maybe we should develop a new instrument, a new mission to study the radiant the energy budgets for some planets and satellites. I think that's it. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Mm -hmm. uh, what data is used to calculate the Lorentz cycle is based on uh, GCM simulation? No, based on actually the satellite observations. Because uh, you are right, uh, for the, to calculate the Lorentz energy cycle, you need a lot of variables. Basically, I think most of the variables from observations, like the zonal wind, uh, like the, uh, the temperature, the potential height, but for some uh, some variables like the vertical velocity, it's not easy to measure it. So we use sort of a, a simulation of the GCM, something like that. But basically, based around the observation, not the uh, not the uh, numerical simulations. Okay. Um, how do you estimate the uncertainties in the the quantities you reported for for Jupiter, like the the Bond albedo? Uh, yeah, example? actually. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I put a reference right here. I have a long discussion for the albedo. Right, actually, of course, there are a lot of uh, you know uncertainty sources, you know, like the calibration, navigation, whatever. Uh, I have I put a reference right here. If you are interested, you can email me. I can email email you back. It's an impress, not published yet, but it will be published in the next couple of weeks. But anyway, if you email me, I email you back with the reference. I have a long discussion for all sources, the uncertainty. They actually, with, I, I, I didn't put an error bar right here, but actually, there are error bar over there. Is it like 10%? Uh, no, no, 1% at most. Because, the, as I said, the Cassini observations are basically perfect. The wavelength coverage, the face angle coverage is perfect, basically. So we have very good, I think, results, very precise results, I think. 